Hey, Rabbi Daniel Wiener, Senior Rabbi of Temple to Her Sinai in Seattle, Washington. How you doing? Uh, all things being equal, uh, doing okay. It's It's been mercifully sunny here for the past week or so, which is unusual enough, but the timing could not have been better in light of everything that's going on in the world right now. Seattle's been at the forefront of the United States response to COVID-19 and the challenging situations. What are you seeing out there right now? What What does day-to-day life look like? Well, day-to-day life is fairly sequestered and constrained. Uh, I think uh, you're experiencing also in Pennsylvania these things. We're probably about two weeks ahead of you in terms of just duration of this and the intensity of this. Um, So really what we're trying to do, particularly as a synagogue community, is to find the balance between uh, thoughtful and judicious caution and and, and bringing comfort and a sense of security to folks. We don't want people to obviously engage in irrational panic, even though they should be careful. Um, but by the same token, we, uh, we want to provide a sense of comfort and connection that synagogue communities are uniquely positioned to offer. What does that look like? How are you staying connected with people or how are you encouraging people to connect one to the other? In this you know, yeah, it's, we're in a little bit of a paradoxical situation because um, the ways in which we've normally, you know, provided connection for people are no longer available in the flesh and blood uh, uh, manner. But um, but this is a time that, in some ways, is more intensively desirous on people's behalf for uh, for connection. And so, really, we were fortunate that we had a pretty good streaming infrastructure and social media presence and infrastructure already in place. So though that has been ramped up considerably because now it's really the only way, only means of connecting with people for the most part, um, it, it, it's been something that's been actually very, very successful. Uh, our first two streaming Shabbat services had about 1500 people with legitimate views, not just reaches on Facebook and through our streaming website. And so those are high holiday numbers. So that testifies to both the accessibility and ease of people connecting through social media and also the intense need for people to connect uh, in any way possible. I mean, I think one of the things that's gonna emerge from this crisis, uh, God willing, when we get to the other side sooner than later, I hope, is um, a renewed awareness and appreciation for the bonds of community. Um, You know, they say there are no atheists in foxholes, you know, there's no individuals, uh, you know, kind of at a time of of community crisis, people really want to be with one another. And I think there's going to be a renewed appreciation of something that's been taken for granted up to this point. Yeah, I find it somewhat ironic that I've spent the first 10 years of my rabbinate encouraging people to leave technology behind as a way to connect with individuals. And now it's the only way we have to embrace one another is to embrace that technology. But you're right. Hopefully we'll go through a sense ahead, of please. yearning within us, right? It can't replace a hug. No, absolutely. Absolutely. But one of the, the upsides of this, I hope, is that, you know, we're all painfully aware of the... Uh, the downsides, the dark sides of technology. I think this this experience is really uh, uh, focusing in, in in really a stark way as to what the potential, you know, true blessings and upsides of technology are if they're used in constructive and affirming and connecting ways. That's right. How are you connecting with individuals in their greatest times of need? We as rabbis are not able to go to elder care facilities right now. We're not able to do hospital visits at the clip that we used to. How are you using technology or phone? How are you staying connected to people who are most vulnerable right now? Yeah, pretty early on, um, we put together a a group of individuals, including the board of uh, the congregation, uh, the caring committee, uh, community committee of the congregation, and a number of other folks. And we've had volunteers kind of coming out of the woodwork wanting to do anything to be helpful. And we basically took a list of our congregants, and we're a pretty large congregation, took a list of our congregants 
I think at first really 70 and over, maybe it was 60 and over, and really split it up amongst uh, leadership and those who were willing and literally made calls to, to all of those people in the congregation. And we're going to kind of do this cyclically, I think, uh, every week and a half or so, um, because so many of those folks, um, listen, in the best of times, they're somewhat disconnected and isolated where they live. Now they truly are isolated. No one can come visit them. And um, the, the responses have been uh, touching and heartwarming. People are just so extremely grateful for even just a very brief call and, and touch of base and um, uh, a sense that the, the larger community hasn't forgotten them, that, they, that we think about them, we hope they're well. And um, you know, when it's appropriate, if someone needs something and we can, a volunteer can get something and drop it on, off in someone's porch in a really distant way, um, you know, we're, we're able to do that. But that's something that we did very early on, recognizing that the first um, psychic casualties of this crisis are older folks who um, are, are significantly isolated and disconnected. How are you doing life cycle events? Have you had, God forbid, a funeral? How are you handling B'nai Mitzvah services, weddings as we approach wedding season in Seattle? How are people responding? Yeah. Um, Weddings have been essentially postponed, uh, you know, by most folks. B'nai Mitzvah, um, those that haven't been postponed um, now have very significant strictures where you can only really have 10 or less people. And we're, we're certainly willing to stream it out to however many hundreds of guests people want. I think, though, that's a... Um, that's a fast moving, uh, uh, a fast changing situation. Um, I think in the not too distant future, uh, we are gonna be where California is and have kind of a more sequestered shelter in place uh, experience. So I think at some to some degree, everything's gonna be either postponed or if people really insist on doing it, it's gonna have to be remote. But thus far, we have a handful that are still on our calendar over the next couple of weeks in this in this uh, markedly constrained way, um, but a lot of other people have have postponed, recognizing that they don't they don't want to do that kind of experience. Funerals, um, there are some that are starting to come down the pipeline. I um, uh, I think it's going to be more and more. My understanding, though, and I don't know if this is the case in Pennsylvania yet, but we were just doing some research this morning, and uh, like Italy. Um, I think they're going to uh, um, they're going to say we we can't do funerals that um, uh, they're just going to do an interment with uh, cemetery staff, uh, but they really don't want any any visitors or, or any guests or any participants. And um, what I'm thinking we'll do again. This is a I'm kind of speaking out of turn here because this is a very very recent kind of phenomenon. Literally this morning. You know, we'll probably have to do something with, you know, postponed memorial services, you know, well after, well after an interment or a cremation or what have you, just because um, there have been some um, notable uh, uh, circumstances around the world where uh, funerals have been um, the sites of significant spread. So uh, I think we're, we're all kind of moving in that direction, unfortunately. And it's one of the most heartbreaking, obviously, elements of this is a time where you really want people to be together and to find comfort. Um, we can't do it without risking life. And so, you know, the Pikuach Nefesh being almost the transcendent Jewish value above all others, you know, we do what we have to do. Yeah, you know, life is really getting put on hold right now, being put on hold not only for individuals and families in their homes, these life cycle events that we've been looking forward to for long periods of time, or God forbid, are thrust upon us and we have to do the best we can in a time of mourning. But it's also true for a lot of small business owners as the economy grinds to a halt, right? Never has the butterfly effect been more fully realized than when somebody sneezes in China and global markets begin to shut down. Mm. Okay, it's a dark time for many economically, and it's going to be a challenging time for nonprofits and for religious organizations and synagogues the world over. You started to think about this. What, what do you foresee happening in the coming, coming days, months, and years down the road? 
in the narrowest sense, um, in addition to asking for volunteers and providing kind of a clearinghouse for ways in which we match volunteers with people who are in need, we're also um, uh, asking our congregants who own small businesses to kind of let us know what they're doing and, and um, how we can be helpful. And it, it seems like one of the ways in a, in a very direct one-to-one -one way that we can help some of those businesses is buying gift cards um, so that there's some some flow of revenue to be used obviously at a later time. In terms of the larger issue, um, I know that our congregation and every congregation in the country is going to be struggling with um, what to do in a uh, uncertain at the very best and um, much more uh, uh, truncated and diminished financial situation at, at worst. Um, with my leadership and what we've been talking about is first and foremost, the ultimate uh, overriding principle is to really try to balance um, uh, prudent financial stewardship with uh, an expression of Jewish values. And that, um, and finding that balance and using Jewish values as the prism through which we evaluate business decisions um, is really critical from um, uh, continuing to pay our staff at least through a, a, a certain amount of time and then reevaluating and seeing where we are um, to uh, just recognizing that um, while seeking to be financially responsible, we also um, need to continue to serve our, our congregation and we need a significant staff to do so. And one of the other things we're thinking about is this is going to end um, and we don't want to emerge from this so decimated as a, as a congregational infrastructure that we're unable to get up and running and be responsive at a time when people are really going to want to kind of reconnect and so finding that balance between recognizing the financial constraints that are happening around the world um, the uncertainty about what uh, what the financial situation is going to be um, but also really holding tight to our jewish values and understanding in some ways that um, those values are most defining and most shaping of our identity when we are in crisis that we really need to look to those balance them with a sense of financial responsibility and uh, understand that um, we are staying our community in the long run and um, seeking to uh, to do things a little differently than you know a restaurant might do or or other kind of small business it is it's going to force a lot of difficult decisions and i think the idea of keeping our values at the forefront continuing our ethical obligation to those who work for us, as well as we'll be here, here to support families when we get back from this trying time is really important. Absolutely. So you have been a tremendous mentor to me and my rabbinate in my time in Seattle, and now I could use a little bit of that advice, though I have flown a bit further from the nest. You're a couple weeks ahead of us. What, what tips would you have for a community that is just beginning? We're one week in to having our building closed, to beginning to feel the effects of social isolation and what it is to be at home and disconnected from community. What tips, what tricks, what should we be doing? Well, on a, uh, an existential kind of uh, health policy um, uh, pr um, uh, perspective, you know, I think it's really, really, really important that people maintain social distancing and stay in our homes if possible. Um, you know, I think there's finally kind of a dawning awareness on the part of young people who felt, as they always do, that they're invincible. Um, uh, there's now a dawning kind of realization that this is this is impacting young people as well. And if it doesn't impact them in a life and death way, it's certainly as as carriers you know, impacts uh, all their parents and their grandparents. And so I would really, really uh, encourage, strongly encourage people to follow the guidelines of public policy folks in your area and to take a little short-term discomfort and discombobulation for hopefully a long-term uh, ending of this crisis sooner than later with as little, little ca as few casualties as possible. Um, the other key thing I would say is that, um, you know, just get your um, uh, social media and your streaming infrastructure 
as um, um, strongly in place as possible because it's just going to become more and more challenging to meet the needs of the congregation and the more you've dealt with some of those logistics early on the easier it will be as things become you know more difficult and the other thing i would uh counsel just in general but aaron to you in particular and this is something that we're just kind of coming coming to to terms with right now is you know the first couple of weeks have been kind of um, a reactive mode. This is all new. We're not sure what to do. We want to be sure the con uh, that the community knows we're out there. But I think we have to find the, uh, kind of a sweet spot and a balance between uh, providing touch points for our congregants, but not so inundating uh, the community who are also receiving things from all sorts of other organizations that it becomes just you know static and noise. I think we have to be very judicious, um, um, but 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 uh, regular in how we uh, connect with our community. Wonderful. Well, I so appreciate your time. Please give my best to your family. Is everyone home with you right now? Yes, everyone. My, my son was on spring break and now it's summer break. And uh, uh, yeah, we uh, brought my daughter home from New York City because things are getting a little hairy there. So. Um, and listen, um, love to you, Emily, and the kids, and to everyone at Temple Emmanuel. Um, really, my my um, most ardent prayers for your health, your safety, and your well-being. And please, 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 um, don't go down the dark rabbit holes of fear and anxiety. We are going to get through this. We just all need to pull together and create a sense of solidarity that will be the key to getting through this. Rabbi, thank you so much. Thank you.